the, we'll do, look at the female first and then look at the male. And I think the easiest way to understand the orientation of all the, of the organs, the visceral organs now, that's what we're going to focus on, that are in that pelvic canal is this, is this sagittal, mid-sagittal section. Um, but just to be clear exactly what we're looking at, I think it's nice to have the three-dimensional view of the, um, of the whole pelvis. And so just to make sure this is clear, what we've done is taken a slice right through here like that, right? And when we do that, we, in terms of the outer bony pelvis, we slice through the, the sacrum and the pubic symphysis. So if we kind of, you know, put this in position like this and look at what we have here, here's the end of the lumbar vertebrae and the sacrum back here, even those little coccygeal vertebrae down here. And then that would be that pelvic canal coming around to the front, and this is the pubic symphysis at the front there. So everybody oriented to that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, inside that pelvic canal, what we're going to find um, in both males and females is at the posterior part, right up against the sacral vertebrae, is going to be the tail end of the digestive tract or the rectum. And the reason this is here kind of just cut off like that is because this is coming from the sigmoid colon, which it would have come out of our plane of cut from, um, the, from the left side of the, the descending colon over here. It, it kind of makes that S shape. That's why we call it sigmoid to come here into the rectum. And then the anus or feces are expelled from the body. Um, I might also just make clear that we think of this as a canal in the bony um, in the bony pelvis, but in life, there's a floor under here, a muscular floor, and so this whole muscular floor supports these organs in the pelvic canal, and we'll, I don't have a good way to show you that muscular floor. We don't really have a model of it here in lab, but in lecture, we'll take a look at the components of that muscular floor of the pelvis. But basically, there's, if you, cro if you think about it, there's an anal, there's a um, urogenital triangle at the front, where the urinary and genital organs are located, and what we call the anal triangle at the back. And so the um, end of the rectum with the anus passing through that anal triangle of the pelvic floor. Okay? Um, questions on that? Is it? Tail end of the gut tube. No, no. <laughs> That's what we've got posteriorly. Anteriorly, just behind the pubis, or the pubic symphysis, again, same for men and women, is going to be the urinary bladder, and that's what we're looking at here. This would be basically an empty bladder with no urine in it. It's got the muscular wall, that transitional epithelium lining it, and then in women, you can see the urethra passing again right through the pelvic floor now here anteriorly, the urogenital triangle of the pelvic floor. As the bladder fills up with urine from the ureters, you can kind of see the ureter coming into the corners here. As the bladder fills up, it extends up into the abdominal cavity. It can come to fill with 500 milliliters, even close to 1,000 milliliters, depending on the person. So it can really come to occupy quite a space up here. So that's constantly filling and then, of course, being evacuated when we urinate. So, um, and what we'll take a look at, though, of course, it is very different in men. In women, the urethra is just a straight shot out through the pelvic floor whereas in men, it's going to go into the base of the penis and all the way out to the tip of the penis. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. Now, um, the further anterior or in front of the urethra, suspended from the midline pubic symphysis in women is going to be the clitoris. And it's in the same position as the homologous organ for the penis in men, but in women, of course, it's much smaller. It has... Um, and the urethra, of course, doesn't pass through the body of the clitoris. The urethra passes out straight behind it. However, similar to the penis, the clitoris has spongy erectile tissue. During sexual excitement, the clitoris gets erect um, and is part of that whole pleasure cycle that women experience, just like men. Um, so, well, I wouldn't say it's just like men. <laughs> you don't quote me on that, but that women also experience, so the clitoris is part of that. Um, again, analogous to the penis. Um, and then just... Posterior or behind the urethra is going to be the vaginal opening, and the vagina itself is just a muscular tube. So you know it's cut down. It's, you know it's been cut mid-sagittally down the middle here, but this is the vagina, the totality of the vagina, and in its interior end, 
you have this whole organ here is the uterus with the cervix. The cervix, just like cervical, refers to the neck region. In this case, it's referring to that neck-like part of the uterus that inserts into the vagina right here. Um, I'm going to say a little bit. I'm going to say more about the uterus in a minute, but just mm -hmm. to make clear that um, in the pelvic floor, in this urogenital triangle, the vaginal opening, the urethra, and the clitoris are all wrapped around by what are called the labia majorum. Labia meaning the same thing like lips, and majorum meaning larger lips. Okay, in the in that urogenital triangle. Um, the Going back to the uterus, so the, um, the, uh, the cervix of the uterus has an opening into the body of the uterus. Um, and then on either side, I guess I should, everything that we've talked about so far are midline sagittal organs. But coming in on either side of the uterus, so now we have to go out of that midline sagittal plane to look in here, is going to be the fallopian tube going to what are called the fimbri, which wrap around the ovary. So what's going on here? Um, at ovulation, um, which we'll talk a lot more about menstrual cycles and when ovulation happens and all that functional part, but just to get the anatomy down. At ovulation, there's an ovum or an unfertilized egg that matures on the surface of the ovary. It forms what's called a follicle. It actually pops or bursts off of the surface of the ovary and these what are called fimbri, that's another word for fingers, they're like these finger-like projections. They almost look like a, one of those sea anemones or something like that. At the end of the fallopian tube, they tend to find that region where the right follicle is located so that when the egg pops off there, it gets taken up into the fallopian tube, right, or the oviduct, right in the center of those fimbri, and begins that trip down the fallopian tube to the uterus. Okay. That whole trip takes about a week, about seven days, and during that time, if sperm have been introduced, okay, um, the best, most likely time to have a fertilization event leading to a pregnancy is about 24 to 72 hours, or one to three days after ovulation, okay? And the sperm themselves, they're introduced into the cervix of the uterus, take about 12 to 24 hours to work their way through the uterus and all the way up the fallopian tube, okay? So, you know, you might have seen images maybe of, you know, that look like fast swimming sperm or something like that, but remember, these are tiny cells that are going great distances, you know, in a world where, everything seems like molasses to them, you know, in terms of how thick the fluids are and everything like that, because they're so small. So it's a very, you know, everything happens at a slower pace than what we're used to thinking of or when we visualize it, you know, in a big microscope field. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all I'm going to say for now on the theme.